Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Today's uh, February 5th, and today is also day 35 of our traditional and digital live stream, where I take you from digital to traditional. Can't wait to take this painting up into an oil painting. That's gonna be fun, setting up that stream, because I haven't done that yet. Gonna be a lot of learning on that one, but Got a lot to talk about on this tiger today. <clears throat> Got a lot to do still. It's going to be several days before, or several streams before we actually finish this tiger up. I've already prepared the canvas. Um, actually using an older canvas that uh, I've painted on already for a painting that I'm not keeping. So I painted gray over that one. And yeah, started... Uh, getting that drawing right away so that it would be completely dry by the time I need to start drawing this tiger out and the jungle and get everything set up on that canvas. So starting that process already, even though it could be, you know, three or four days before we get there. Now, the first thing I want to talk about is the problem that I realized with our composition. Well, not really with the composition. Composition's good. But, and here's the, here's the great thing about kind of living with a piece for an extended period of time. It's nice to be able to start something and then finish it right away, you know, within a few hours or something like that. But when you're going deep on something like this, where it takes you a lot of time, you have more time to really contemplate. Good morning, Thinker. How are you? Hope you're great. Hopefully you're great on this Sunday morning. But as I'm living with this tiger and I look at it throughout the day, because I, you know, my XP pen's right on uh, my desk so I can see it throughout the day, no problem. As I live through it throughout the day, I, I you know, I, I see different things. And the one thing that has really struck me as a problem is the cartooniness of it and i'm not talking about in the drawing in the perspective and i'm happy pretty happy with the value i may increase the uh contrast within the values uh maybe darken up the background a little bit i don't know the cartooniness comes from the lack of variation in color and maybe you can see this but if, if I zoom in a little bit, actually with it zoomed out, you can really tell, so might as well keep it this way. The background is a, how can I say? It is one color. It is one hue. And you're probably thinking, uh, what are you talking about? There's all kinds of differences within that. Not really. I mean, I've added a little bit here this morning when I was playing around with it, but if, if we look at the background and I start adding in, you know, just really quickly over the top on a new layer, these different values, just picking out different values, maybe go into a dark value. Let's go back up to a lighter value, even lighter. Maybe this one back here. That one down here at this palm frond. Start just picking out a bunch of these, right? Is cartooniness a function of the digital medium? It is not. Um, definitely not. I have seen artwork that is looks so traditional and has so much texture to it. It moves so far away from, you know, cartoon. It just takes some time, you know, to kind of figure out texture and how to work things up. And the one thing I'm talking about right here, which is this. You can see it better on the artistic color selector. Um, let me break this out so I can make it larger. Okay, I thought I did that. Because usually when you hit that button, it will do it, but I guess not. Um, let's grab it and move it. And then if I can, if I can luckily get the one pixel to make it larger. There we go, now you can see it. So the colors I just picked, here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to start selecting these colors. And what you'll see 
is this little circle here. Now the value is going to move up and down like crazy, but this little circle that we see here is going to stay within the same split place. It's living all around in here. It'll dip within the darks, but just these kind of maybe into the more orangey green in some instance, but we're most of the time we're into these two kind of greens. It doesn't really change hue that much at all. And that is a product of cartooniness. Basically what I've created in the background is a, you know, different levels of the same gradient all over the place. And when you put that against, you know, we were, we were working our design process really hard, right? And we wanted the background to be a grayish green. We wanted the foreground of the tiger to be this kind of orangey color. And you can, I mean, that separation is there. I mean, it's like, it's like punching you in the face. It's so, it's so huge. But we have the same problem with the tiger, right? So if I, let me start selecting some colors on the tiger. I'll start up with the lighter color, even this crazy yellow. Then we'll get into some saturated and the darker colors. What about way down here? And then let's start selecting these. Uh, the, the, this one is the odd man out. Just a little bit though, it didn't go f further out. That's the one where we did a color dodge of the orange. But every color I select here, except for this one. Oh, there must be some green down there. But if you watch it, every color I select here stays within this one area. Um, it's not bad per se but we want more we want more life and the one thing that you don't see that you won't see you won't see life in a gradient so if i just do something like this uh let me click my gradient again that's basically the tiger and the background is a green version of that just a gradient <clears throat> what we really need to do, excuse me, is to have a hue change within these gradients. And I remember mentioning that before it can it comes directly from um, Craig Mullins, who says, if you're going to have a plane change, you want to have a gradient change within that, in that plane, and then also a hue change within that. And we haven't done a lot of changes within those hues within the background or foreground. Now, one, you know, let me bring up my, um, my reference images. There will be some variation within the tiger here. So if I select, you know, this is what we're working from to, and this guy up here to really see the tiger. There's going to be some hue changes within this because we're going to be getting into uh, these whites of the tiger, right? And so we'll get into some grays. Maybe we'll have some reflected greens. Now that I'm thinking about this, we're definitely going to have some reflected greens. Actually, you can see it here within the base of the tiger. These whites, there must be something green underneath the tiger. That's so going to reflect that. Not too much here. It's probably going to be all oranges. Yeah, all oranges. But probably pull some of that out so that there's not this tremendous separation between the background and the foreground between the tiger and its environment maybe now that i'm pointing it out you can see these this stark separation and whenever you have this kind of stark separation it gets a bit cartoony so how do we fix it and i'm not going to really fix it too much right now because i'm excited about getting into the tiger and we can go back to the background after i get a lot of coloration within the tiger but the i already started a layer called background glaze and you can now you really can't see a difference i need to go a bit further in it but if we wanted to fix this and also keep this within our understanding of you know the 
the point we want to get across, our narrative. Yes, uh, it's a good point, Thinker. So creating shadows is more than just adding black. Yes, and once you'll see when we when you go to oil painting, I do not use black ever. Um, and I need to remember to not use black here either. Use a combination of colors to make black. And you're, you're, you're ahead of me on this. Slow down. <laughs> you're always ahead of me on a lot of things. <laughs> um, so we want to keep the background cool, right? And closer to gray. So there's still a separation between the tiger and the background. But we don't have to just use green to do that. So if let's say I let's let's focus on like maybe this this palm frond or no, I like the background, this further background because it's light. You can see the difference a bit easier. So if I pick out one of these mid-tone colors, it's going to be right here within our color wheel, still within the greens. We don't really get out of the greens until, you know, we're over here and in that way. So let's go directly opposite of it. So into these kind of purpley magentas. OK. And as long as we're into a gray, there shouldn't be much difference. Okay. I'm actually glazing purple back here. And this, this is kind of what you want to do. You want to go in and add the life to these areas where it makes sense in a lot of ways, you know, at least the edges, the structure and things would make sense and start kind of pushing more of that life in there. So we can go all the way up to like these yellows, but we're going to keep it gray. This will add that variation within the color that's going to give some more life back there and keep it from being cartoony. Let's go into the lighter values. Now I'm not going to be touching my value scale here on the left. What I will touch and mess with is just the hue. Where is the hue at? That's why this artistic color picker is really good for this, uh, because you you get a, a clearer separation between hue, value, and chroma. You just pop that in in some places. And if I continue with that, you will see that it does breathe some life in there. It, it I mean, I could see that almost right away, but I'd like to do is go into these kind of mid-tone colors and then go into a red, right? Because if I'm, and here's another way of doing this, because this is a green, this is what I selected right here. And then let's go into a red. What does red do with green? It's gonna gray it out. So if I, I'm using uh, one of the David Ravoy brushes right here, all of the green, these kind of teal green brushes are glazing brushes. Uh, as he's indicated. So I can put this kind of red, this grayish red over this green, and it's going to gray it out even more. We're not getting anywhere near to the saturation that the tiger has. Like we worked our design pro process so well and separated everything so well that it turned cartoony <laughs> so we did we did good but um maybe a bit too good so not not today maybe not in the next couple streams because i want to work directly on the tiger we'll probably head back to the background and we'll breathe more life into it and i don't think we have to do it on the minute scale either i'm going to be playing with things like um picking out a particular layer like this one and then hitting control U, control U, not control H, and then seeing how I can adjust these sliders to change the hue and see what, what happens. You know, if I go into these really saturated colors like this purple, you know, now it's like we're looking in the background. But if I, let's go back down to zero, but if I just adjust slightly, this will get, you know, more in the blues. I want to bring in some more in there. You know, that may do it. I don't know. I think that was a bit too overall. I'm kind of of the mind to 
go at it a bit differently, you know, with paint strokes. Get those textures worked up as well and all of that. I think that is what's going to add a lot more interest uh, to the background. Breathe some more life into it. But let's continue where we left off last time. After all of that, I'm trying to remember what brush I was using for this. Let's see. Uh, yeah, I think it was this one. I was enjoying the, uh, the texture on that brush. And, you know, the one thing that I was doing is I was adding in these whites, but I was keeping them in the orange areas. I may try and push them out of the orange areas. Let's look at this tiger up here, do some selections. Nah, orangey green jumps into gray down here. It's it looks like we focus on a lot more greenish colors. Yeah, but remember, we always have to think about our our edited light source as well. So want to think about that as well. OK, let's get back into it with the drawing drawing and I'm going to begin with adding some of these stripes in today I'm on the correct layer so that's good what's really cool about these stripes is um, oh that's in a green what's really cool about these stripes is that they are what am i trying to say here chris they have their own texture their own edges i mean they're hair, hair follicles made up of you know a shape i think i need to make this bigger so we're trying to get that texture within that this looks different than what i have yeah that's that's this is not the right brush What brush was I using? Ugh. I'm kind of annoyed that I don't remember this. Oh, uh, this one had the same shape. I think it was this one. He's got several brushes in here with the same shape. Let me try. Okay, I think that was it. We'll keep messing with it until we get it right. This is the part of the painting where it gets into the details. I think what I will do on this is play outside the lines a bit more really kind of push some of these textures, especially within the stripes. <laughs> it's funny how I selected that. It goes just to a very light gray. I always have to be careful when you're using the selection tool. Uh, you hold control to select uh, what you're doing but remember it's one pixel and if you zoom way in there's red orange yellow green there's all kinds of pixels in there and depending on where, where you land you could be close to what you're seeing or really far off it depends and as, as i climb to the top of the skull here where most of the light is going to be I'm going to also um, I'm going to pick out some colors up here I'm going to also lighten up these this stripe so it's a bit lighter because even a dark color like that getting hit by the light is going to get a little bit lighter you know it'll be kind of a, a gray tone that gets lighter 
It's funny when I'm picking out all of these um, colors within the stripes, the dark stripes, it's it's hovering around greens. Let's keep it that way. And what I'll do is I'm going to go back to the advanced color picker. That way I can really make some small adjustments to the values and things a little bit easier. And I'm going to play with these sliders down here. Still, I still don't fully understand those sliders, honestly. I'll have to read the Krita manual. Oh, it was so funny. Um, last stream, we discovered this reference image thing where you could actually put your references, you know, in your document, save them out as a separate document, and you could have them anywhere on the canvas. Or way off the canvas, which is fantastic. I didn't know you could do that. And I was super excited about it. And I was telling my friend about it yesterday and I'm like, oh, I got something for you. It's so awesome. I love it. And he's like, oh yeah, I know about that. <laughs> wah, wah. I just felt, I was like, oh, darn it. <laughs> I thought I was going to show him something new and awesome, but he was way ahead of me already. Story of my life. Let's see what kind of value we got over there. Whoa, too high. Not yet, not yet. So the structure of this head indicates, I mean, if our, you know, cause our light's coming down that way, here's our light this way, maybe straight down, honestly, shadow within the eye, little bit of tiny shadow on the side of the nose, kind of indicate that. Um, and from looking at these two tigers, there's a fall off here, but not as much as you would think. I need to look at that 3D rendering of the tiger. That would help me understand um, the form a bit better. I'm kind of jumping around a bit as well. So we have this <clears throat> really high value here where the light is hitting the tiger directly. So we're going to edit our, well, it's really interesting how that kind of flies around there. Um, we're going to edit our stripe so it gets a lighter color as well, especially within there. There's a <clears throat> urge in me right now to 
get rid of the tediousness of this. But honestly, it, you know, it's going to be part of the process. I'm sure there's probably some tools that I can use or some methods to speed this up a bit. But I'll get to those eventually. You've probably been seeing a lot of things um, online and in videos and everywhere about AI art and all the AI tools that are out there now that can help us do things a lot faster. But, you know, several things that I have been watching and I agree uh, tremendously with is that There is a learning involved that you're passing up. So you, you, know, you can use like ChatGBT, you could use Midjourney, you could use all of these new and awesome tools to speed up your process and get you to a point where your art looks a lot better in some way. Or your writing. Like for instance, you know, on my videos, maybe the scripting and things like that is a lot easier. That's great. I can speed up some things. But understanding the process is important. Because there's a mechanicalness that happens within, uh, especially, you know, AI. And computers are dumb totally um what do they call it they call them a tom totally obedient moron that's what computers are they only do what we tell them to do so if we don't really understand the process and we're telling a computer to do something for us they'll just do exactly what we say it's like Okay, sure, you want this? And usually, you know, if you don't understand what's going on or why you would want to do that, you'll just get exactly what uh, you asked for and there's not a lot of growth involved within that, within yourself. So you're not learning the, the processes, you're not le learning the underlying idea behind everything. It's just um, you're having your computer do something for you. You could probably make a really good living on something like that, I'm sure. I know a lot of people are probably doing that already, but um, in the long run, you will short yourself on these underlying aspects of whatever you're doing. And I'm trying to keep this generalized because it's, it's not only for art and artists. I wanna get rid of this drawing a bit more. And I, I've turned off the drawing. I'm trying to keep it generalized because this pertains to so many others. Yeah, that's right. There it is. So, so many other different aspects of what you can use uh, AI for. Actually, you know, now that I think about it, it's very similar to tracing. You could, you know, find, go out and find your favorite artist, one that you love and admire. You say, man, I wish I could do that. And then you come up with this method to just perfectly trace. Not only, you know, the drawing and everything, but perfectly copy 
what they have and you and then you say oh awesome i've done this but, but because you have done that because you've done you know this extreme master copy right do you think that you will be able to go out there and on your own take the principles that created that art and reproduce it yourself no you won't be able to And why is that? Because there's so much. It's like you look at surface level in art. If you just focus on the surface level of art, you'll miss the history involved and all the learning involved. Constantly goes back to um, that not... I'm not sure how true the urban myth is, I guess. Picasso gives, uh, or a lady asks Picasso for a drawing. He's like, sure. Takes him four seconds to draw something. And he says, here you go, that'll be $5,000. And she says, well, it took you only a few seconds to, to make it. And he's like, no, it took my whole life. Because there's so much behind you know it and you can't pass that up so why am i talking about ai stuff right now uh, because it's out there you know and because it's you know it's a part of our lives now and i think it you know well i know it can be used for good for helping us in some way if as long as we use it as a tool a tool to further us in some way to help us out um to improve what we're doing, right? It can be used well. But as soon as you le lean on it too heavily, what you're giving up is really your humanity. All right, back to the tiger. I'm interested in this space right here because this is where it gets more concave, like underneath the cheek. I need to bring in some of these darker stripes. Now I can barely see the stripes. So I need to pop that back up. Okay, there they are. I'm glad I locked that layer so I don't draw on it. That was good. Good job, Chris. So I'm gonna throw in these stripes first get that drawing correct and the texture started at least what i'm finding is you know that it's easier to put in the stripes and then you know get the stripes kind of figured out at least their location and all that and there's a combination of stripes i'm looking at here because I, i'm pulling some from one tiger and some from the other but getting these darker stripes in I'm just going to fill this in pretty quickly. And then using the the lighter colors to create the texture. So here's where some gray is going to come in. We got to get the right value of gray. I think I'm going to darken it up a bit more. We've changed our light source. It doesn't look like what the tiger has right now. And I'm going to I'm going to really kind of push that gray on that too. Maybe bring it into some green. Cuz it's almost it's not really facing down. It's getting close to it. It needs to be darker. A warm green because we're dealing with the local color of the tiger as well. Just like what I talked about at the beginning of the stream, I'm trying to introduce these other hues within 
within the place that I'm working in, within this tiger to keep it alive. And I've, I'm finding more and more that it's it's beneficial to work from dark to light in this medium. And honestly, in oil paint, it's the same. It's, you know, you work a, a bit more dark to light on things. That's not a hard and fast rule, though. You can work light to dark, no problem. Okay, go back to that gray and then we're gonna lighten it up a bit. Just a bit. Maybe a bit more. What about adding a subtle purple in the shadows? Let's see what that looks like. In the shadows of the white of the tiger or just anywhere on top of the orange, the white. Actually, I feel like I can take this gray even darker. Right there. Let's try it within the white. Let's go all the way to like an extreme purple, okay? And I'm gonna go back to my artistic color picker to see where I'm at as far as um, chroma, which I'm really close to gray. Kind of hard to see when it's it's all the way the, up there at the top. Yes, in the white, okay. Yeah, purple's fine. I mean, we're, we're pretty gray on this. What if we intensify it? I tell you what, let's do this. Let's get the like the general value first, and then let's just bring it into purple. I think right around there. Yeah, because we're so gray, I mean, it's not... Um, really affecting some, you know, things too much. Let's, I wonder if you can intensify it that way. No, it takes it more into blue. Let's just drag it over. There you go. A bit more intensity here. So why purple? So if, if I had to guess on that, so purple's around here, you know, these kind of colors. And then this is all like a greenish color. So uh, to gray out a greenish yellow, purple, right? So we have a greenish yellow to gray it out a bit more. There you go, purple, that would work. Um, if you have, you know, all this orange, like you're right around in these kind of orange colors. You want this kind of bluish teal to gray things out. So you could do that too. Magenta, green, you know, you're looking at your complementary colors. Which will really um, help you to get to a neutralized tone. Let's, let's work this up a bit lighter going to the top. And I like that there is this kind of mid 
white and orange within this area. So it's it's not just totally orange. It get, it's getting closer to you know um, like over here. So let's bring some of that in. Let's see what happens when I take the brush a lot larger. Really lightly kind of adding this in. Taking my time on this. I want it to look good. I also don't want to kill it with too much detail. Not trying to make a photograph. That's That has always been a really hard balance for me. I can sit there and observe and copy forever, but that's not our purpose. And so let's zoom out a bit. Instead of getting deep into it, keep a bigger brush and let's, let's pull back and work on it at, at this level. See what kind of bigger changes we can make to our painting. really like this color within here, but it's a combination of multiple colors, like right there on the muzzle. I'm going to select several times in the same place. I think it's going to be more gray. And what's interesting is as we get to, oh, that's funny. As we get to the top of the nose here, um, and you know, all, all around this area, the, the hair follicles are really small, really tiny. And, you know, I'm gonna change this. Uh, so what we need to do is, see how we can keep that texture going. Let me break this down. Really using the brushes in different ways, I think, is, you know, helps tremendously with this. So let's bring this a little bit closer to yellow and then lighten it up a bit. And then just trying to get this subtle curve within the bridge of the nose over to the side of the nose while at the same time achieving that texture. So what I can do is I could use this brush and add in, you know, maybe we go into this darker color. So here's the bridge of the nose. I got, I'm, I'm bringing in lots of texture like long hair. It's so speckled that I'll, I jump around everywhere within here if I try to select. So I just have to just pick the colors myself. Bring in some of these darker colors. I like how, you know, it just kind of changes randomly in some places. You know, like fur would do. It's not completely uniform. Just adding in some stupid texture kind of everywhere right here.
And then I'm going to select, well, not yet. Let me add a little bit more. Maybe I'm, I'm going to get into some deeper, darker grays, right? Right on the top of the nose. Even darker. I may have to pull that back afterwards, but that's okay. Really just moving my, my brush around so it's as haphazard as possible right here as I'm working to get that kind of textural feel. And I need to bring some of this down into the side of the muzzle. I'm obliterating our um, direct light source a bit as well. <clears throat> I can always bring that back. What's important is I get the form down first. We can add on those kind of extra lighting things a bit later. So then let's let's select this brush here. I think this was the brush I was looking at. Yeah. And I can turn it into an eraser. And I can lightly kind of hit it in places to bring that texture down. I could also do that with, if I go down to the uh, smudging brushes, which ones are the smudging brushes? Ah, yeah. So these guys down here. And pull down that texture a bit. Yeah, I just remembered I said last time that I would work a little bit closer on that eye. The left eye. I have not, and that's okay. We will have to get to it eventually. It will happen. Yeah, I really like the greens and stuff that we added in there. I think that's adding so much to this. Definitely. I might take a little bit of that green and put it within this gray up here. Because, you know, any place where those grays kind of turn down. make some bigger changes. I'm going to bring my drawing back up to around closer to 100%. And actually, let me zoom in so I can get it right. We're going to just block in a lot of this dark area over here. This dark stripe.
I'm constantly using the royal we <laughs> within the stream. I like that idea. Like, you know, it's it's us doing this, not just me. You have input as well. I should ask more questions, honestly. Keep others engaged. Instead of constantly lecturing, it's kind of like me just talking about myself all the time. Or things that I want to talk about. It's all about me, okay? It's just all about me. No, no, it's also about you guys too. So the question is, has this been helpful? What are we learning here? Or what are you learning? Are, we, are you learning anything? Is it taking too long? Is, are you, do you wish maybe that I would work this up off the stream and then talk about what I did off the stream? Or do you want to see just every little bit? Because I'm fine with either one. Actually, no, I'm, I'm, I'm more, I'm more inclined to just work on this on the stream, honestly. I, I, what, what has helped me is getting in this mode of having to talk about what I'm doing all the time. I think the reason why that has helped so much is because, you know, art is a lonely thing in a lot of cases. You're deep into your canvas and your world and what you're doing. And lots of artists are, you know, in their studio working day in, day out enjoying what they're doing, yes. But it's about what, you know, you're creating, what we're creating. And there's a lot of thought that goes on within the artist's head as they're creating, as I'm, I'm creating. And a lot of times those thoughts will stray into you know, as you're painting, oh man, you know, should I, uh, what do I need to get at the grocery store today? You know, maybe some more eggs, but there's, I think there's an egg shortage going on right now. So I wonder if they even have any eggs. I have to, you know, go to maybe several different stores to get eggs. And then all of a sudden you're thinking, you, know, you kind of wake up from that. You're like, was I just thinking about underwear or something? Right, you just wake up, and then and then you, you look at what you've done, and you think, okay, how did I get here, and why did I get here? Right, you realize that you've been asleep, asleep and working at the same time. <laughs> so sitting here and uh, describing to you what I'm doing is keeping me awake and in the moment on this all the time, which is nice. It could be a good practice for anyone. Talk to yourself when you're in your studio. If you're painting by yourself, you know, don't worry if your significant other or your parents or anyone else is like, uh, yeah, they're talking again to themselves in there. I don't know what's going on. There's nobody in there. You know, explain to them. Well, you know, I'm talking out my process to make sure that you know, I'm focused on what I'm doing and I, my mind doesn't drift. Oh, good thinker replied. Absolutely not. What I want is seeing the challenges, mistakes being made, and then the how and why of the overcoming of those challenge mistakes. I learn a lot more that way. Yes, we all learn from the mistakes, right? And that's probably one of the better ways to learn is 
looking at the mistakes of others all the time. The problem that I'm addressing with my daily art that I saw and I still continue to see is there's so many really good artists out there and they're just fantastic. And a lot of them show their process, uh, you know, now because of digital means and things like that, you know, they're, they're doing time lapses um, on YouTube and those are really good, but it still doesn't show the mistakes. It doesn't show the problems. It doesn't show, you know, the growth. And that's where growth happens. And so many artists, so many, and not just artists, people on the planet everywhere. If you want to be good, you have to avoid mistakes. That it, it could be further from the truth there. If you want to be good, make as many mistakes as you can, as fast as you can, and learn from them and don't repeat them. That's how you get really good, really quickly. Constant, never-ending feedback, moving forward, making the mistakes, and trying not to repeat them. Yeah. But there's no nothing telling you or saying that you, you have to make those mistakes. There are, there's, you know, millennia of art out there. And, you know, in the information age now, there's, ugh, you know, an overwhelming amount of people that have made the mistakes that you're making are going to make, you know, time and time again that you can learn from. But I, I do think that, especially in these scenarios, when you have an artist that's been working for years and years, that still doesn't think he's good, you know, that's me, right? Uh, we all kind of think this. We all have that urge to move forward all the time, get better. Um, watching an artist like me all the time doing this, you can, you can learn from my mistakes and what I do. I just have to talk it out. I have to say, oh yeah, I screwed this up. That humility is is really important. If you can find an artist that has that humility and goes, yeah, awesome, I screwed up, and that you know that's that's another kind of mind shift that I believe um, has helped me over the years tremendously is celebrating the mistakes. Every single mistake that you make, no matter how small, is the most wonderful indication of how you can improve. You know, like, if you want to never improve, avoid your mistakes, which many people do. Cover them up. I didn't do that. No, no, it wasn't me. No, I just won't look at that. I'll just go into the next painting. They get feedback from people. I like that purple that we added. Uh, they get feedback from people and they just kind of ignore it. Oh, that person doesn't know what they're talking about. Oh, well, yeah, I meant to do that. I was watching a video. Um, was it yesterday? I think so. Yeah, because I have another video kind of that I'm bouncing around in my head. It's going to take a while for me to make it. Um... But his point was, shut up. <laughs> it was just kind of, you know, negative, but I could totally understand what he was getting at. It, he, it was basically when you're getting feedback from people, do two things. Shut up and listen. Really listen at what they're saying. And then the next thing is say thank you. Don't offer up any excuses. Don't say, oh yeah, I knew that and I was going to do that. Or, oh, well, this was this problem. Don't offer explanation unless they ask for it. Just shut up, listen, take it in, understand, use that. And then say thank you afterwards. And also have the forethought to understand if it's an advice that you want to take. 
but always listen to it. I, it's like Thinker is on here. I love when, when you say, hey, try this out or try that out. Or especially when you say, that's not looking so good. I don't really like that. There's so many fragile artists out there that everyone else who has experienced that fragility and the other artists being so fragile that they don't want to give feedback. They don't want to hurt the artist's feelings. You know, if you're a mother, if you're a father, if you are a manager, if you're above someone in some way, give them the negative feedback that they need. You can, because you can do it or the constructive feedback that they need. I wouldn't say negative, probably constructive feedback that they need. Because if you keep it constructive, they can learn. But if you just sit there and ignore mistakes and you pamper too much, they're not learning. And I always tend to for learning all the time. Tell me what you think I'm doing wrong. Because art is subjective, okay? It's, and you as an artist have to understand that, that everyone has their own opinion. I may love this tiger, the way it looks and everything, and then someone may say it's the worst thing that they've ever seen on the planet and it's awful. And then, you know, there's 50 other people that would say, you know, I can't wait till this is done because I'm going to tell him that I want to buy it. I want a print of it. I can't wait for that. That would be awesome. You just don't know because it's subjectivity. But to deny a person that feedback is not helping them. If you want to help an artist, tell them what you think. Like literally say, you know, I like your work, but I would not buy it because this. That's a challenge. You don't, you don't get a lot of people to say that. Yes. Thank you, Thinker. I zoomed in too close, getting too much into the details. Zoom out. Yep, got lost in that muzzle there a bit. So that will be mostly in shadow. Thanks for getting me off my soapbox, too. <laughs> okay. Um, I like picking out the local color of this tiger over here, or this tiger up here. Okay. Because it's going to be this... Actually, I'll pick out this kind of, like, gray underneath. And that's what we'll kind of use here but we want to make sure that our values are following the form and the lighting that we are creating so at what point does it turn under and this white turn into completely shadow also at what point do we say that you know the orange ends and the white begins Ah, I have no idea. It's, it's, it's one of those things where you just kind of play with, right? You try something, you say, oh, pull it back, punch it back in. El Morris is here. Hey, I've seen you several times. Thanks for showing up again. Chris, I think the opposite is true, especially if, if you learning yourself, it's hard to find a valuable feedback online. I see lots of people looking for feedback and not so many trying to give feedback. That is so true. Definitely online. Ugh. I, you know, I tried to go on to Proco and every day just provide feedback to people. Um, just my opinions on, you know, helpful comments. You know, Proco.com, I think maybe every... I, I'm assuming that everybody knows about Proco.com, but maybe not. Great forum, great place for people to provide feedback. And they try to do a lot of things where you can put up your work and you ask for feedback. And there's a few people in there that continue to provide, 
you know, wonderful feedback, in-depth feedback. But yeah, you don't see a lot of people online giving feedback. I even did a video about giving and getting feedback because I felt it was such a an important aspect of the art process. Well, it is. I don't, I don't feel it. I know it. I know it's important. Um, but unfortunately, I think a lot of imposter syndrome kind of comes into that. Who am I to tell you that this needs to be fixed in some way or needs to be changed? You, well, my response to that is you're a person with an opinion and your opinion matters, especially in art. So to change that, it starts with you. It starts with us, it starts with me. We see, the, we see it and we say, you know what? I'm gonna start providing feedback. Just like 10 years ago, uh, my website is there for you. It's not for me. I don't review it all the time. I don't look back. Uh, well, I do sometimes, but actually it is for me. I take that back. It's for me too, because it's helpful to look back at my artwork. But for the most part, I hope to get really, really good. I feel like I'm getting there with my oil paintings, although I need to work more on oil painting. Um, thank goodness for what's going to happen with this live stream. I want to get it so good that people are like, how did you do that? I want to know the exact process within that painting. And then you can see it on my website. That's the purpose of it. It's for you. It's a place to see all the mistakes and problems and issues uh, that I've gone through for everything that I've done with, you know, in kind of a, a, in a, not a video format. So that's one thing that I've done to really help this kind of process to make a change within the artistic community um, to try and give in that way. But then I also, you know, I'm here to try and help, not just show off. Although I don't do a lot of showing off. I mean, a lot of this is not the greatest. But yeah, so we could get onto forums. We could ask people to, hey, show me your work if you want to get some feedback. I would love to provide feedback. There has been several individuals on Proco and they fall into the same trap because um, you know, because I did this when I was young as well. It took me a while to understand it. But there's always this feeling of need to um, explain yourself to make yourself seem bigger than you actually are because you you want to be better than you are and you're striving to be better than you are as far you know skill wise so when you get feedback you feel like you have to respond and say oh yeah i know that okay but there's been several people that i've given feedback to and it's like comment after comment you know writing paragraph after paragraph and they'll continually come back and say they'll they'll continually ask for feedback like hey chris can you give me feedback on this I'm like yeah sure i give the feedback and they're like yeah you know i was i did that you know intentionally you know this is what i wanted to try like you're not listening shut up and listen just shut up and listen okay and then say thank you whether you like the feedback or not, listen. More subtle purple in the shadows, please. Perfect. I'm gonna try and grab that purple. Yeah, especially down here. I want some greens as well, because all of this down here is going to be this kind of 
grayish area. Like, let's. Wow, that is not the right value. You see how bright that is? This is not it. Let's see if I can select a darker green. Nope, let's move it closer to gray and darker. I'm going to throw in just some ideas down here real quick. Some coloration, make my brush too big before I end the stream today. Actually, I like how this one tendril of hair is coming out there. So I'm going to totally go against the drawing that we've had underneath throw that in. This is a grayish green and it looks really nice. Let's see how we can uh, adjust it. Let's add that purple into it. Keep it the same value and bring it into a purple. Not that much. It's really playing with some color down here. I need to play with some value as well. We need to be way up here in these darker values, especially at this point. Let's move my reference out of the way. Actually, let's go ahead and hide all the reference. That would be better. Okay, here we are so far today. We've gotten pretty far. Uh, and the reason why it's, it's gone a bit faster today is because I've picked a bigger brush or I've <laughs> I didn't pick a bigger brush. I'm still thinking traditionally. I made my brush larger. I zoomed out uh, and Finger was keeping me in line to stay away. Saying thank you for that, <laughs> to keep zoomed out. And we could get in, you know, still texturally, still keeping it, you know, drawing very similar in a lot of ways, but focusing on the bigger shapes, the bigger values, the bigger colors, the bigger idea, because we can always go in there we can always zoom super far in and refine this at any point in time. We got to get the bigger idea down. That's looking really good. The only thing that I would probably focus on moving forward is getting more variation in those oranges um, on the tiger. I want to see how far we can actually push it. So artistic color picker, let's just do something really quickly before I end. Um, so this is what we're in, in the whole, basically the whole of the tiger. So let's jump over to like this, a green, like a greenish yellow. And where would, let's say over here. Okay. Not really liking that too much. Let's go over here into this kind of purpley color. Oh, more magenta than anything. I'm going to throw that into some places just to see how it reacts with what we have down. See, that's adding a bit more life up in there, definitely. What if we go just one over, yet we sat saturate? Ooh, let's get lighter. 
and even lighter. Just making a few changes here. Not worrying too much about the details right now. So it's, here's the orange where we're normally in. So if I select, you know, up here, I'm in that orange. What if I go into a pink? So I'm not going too far away from the orange itself, but what I am doing is introducing a lot more interest into this, definitely. Yeah, that helps out a lot. What if, what if, I pick out an orange again. Let's keep it, let's actually pick out a darker orange. So we're still in that orange color. It's down here in value. Let's go directly opposite and then gray it out a bit more. Kind of a, a grayish teal. Put this in shadow places. looking pretty good I mean that added just so much more interest to it it's just these kind of subtle hints of differences of life within that okay control s oh gotta hit that more often because this is taking a while to save look at that 60%. Come on, you can do it. I got a pretty beefy computer, although it is getting long in the tooth. <laughs> About six or seven years old now after I built it. I need to build it again. Um, next stream, I am going to zoom in and we're going to get this eye placed. I really need that eye placed to see everything. Um, actually, I like zooming in this far. Look at, look at all the, you know, those like strokes and everything everywhere. That's a lot of fun in there. We can always go in here and refine as much as we want, but I do want this eye to be detailed. So I'll zoom in and work on that uh, a bit more. Actually, I think for the, wow, that's, that's intense. I think for the, um, I just noticed now that as I look at my stream, like what's coming out of my stream, you're not seeing my entire screen. <laughs> I need to fix that. But uh, for the thumbnail picture for today, I think I'm going to zoom in this far and take this photo because that's intense. It's really nice. All right, guys. Thank you so much for showing up, for being here, uh, for listening to my crazy rants and for watching me um, make mistakes and hopefully you're learning from them throughout these live streams this is today day 35 I'm gonna be focusing today to get all of the last six or seven days up on the resources which is on my gum road see the link in the description it'll take you to my website where you can purchase ten dollars and it continues to grow uh, for and I separate every day out into a new crit file that you can download. So you can take it through the entirety of the process uh, with exactly what I've done. Use the code CB50OFF to get 50 off for only five bucks and help me out. If not, just watch the live streams for free. That's cool too. But make sure you use what I'm talking about. Hopefully follow along, do what you can. Um, I'm here to help you become a better version of yourself, whatever that is. 
Thank you so much, and I will see you tomorrow. <laughs>